Today we'll be leaving the fish room and going into the great outdoors to witness the annual spawning migration of the American Shad. These amazing fish are found all along the east coast of North America, ranging from Labrador in Canada all the way down to the St. Johns River in Florida. And in the late 1800s, the American Shad was also introduced to the west coast of the United States and can now be found from Sacramento, California, all the way up to the southern coast of Alaska. But none of these shad remain in the ocean for their entire life because they're what's known as an anadromous fish, which means that they're born in freshwater rivers and then when they're old enough, they swim downstream to the ocean. Then, after a few years in the open ocean, they'll reach sexual maturity and then return to the same freshwater river where they were born in order to lay their eggs. So every year in the late spring, American shad swim up a large river that's right in my backyard here in western Massachusetts. This river is called the Connecticut River, and from its source near the Canadian border all the way down to the sea, it's about 410 miles long, which makes it the longest river in New England. And today we'll be exploring this part of the river right here, which the locals call the Rock Dam. But this image from Google Earth is a bit deceptive because at the time that this photo was taken, the river level was very high due to a large release of water from a hydroelectric dam just a mile or two upstream from here. But on a normal day, most of the water in this part of the river only flows through this small section right here. And all of the places where you see this white water are usually just dry bedrock with no water flowing past. All right, so let's get down to the river and have a look at this naturally formed rock dam to see what it looks like when the water levels are a bit lower and the fish are moving upstream to spawn. This is what it looks like when the water levels are closer to normal and all of those places that were white water in the previous satellite image are now visible as exposed bedrock. So this naturally formed rock dam forces all of the shad to pass through this narrow gap which is only about 15 feet wide. And we'll take a look at the American shad struggling to climb this waterfall a little bit later on in the video. But first, let's head downstream and watch the shad as they're just starting to approach the rock dam. Here we are just a bit downstream from the rock dam. The water here is only about five feet deep and in this bird's eye view it's easy to see the shad slowly making their way upstream from the ocean. Nonetheless, as the shad approach the rock dam, the intensity of the water increases dramatically as all of the water is channeled into this narrow gap in the rock. And I'm willing to battle the current just like these shad so that I can get a close-up look at these amazing fish as they fight their way upstream to lay their eggs. At this point in their journey, these shad have traveled about 120 miles from the mouth of the river to get to where they are right now, and they still have a long way to go. In fact, American shad have been known to travel as far as 272 miles upstream in order to lay their eggs. And these numbers don't include the large distances that they traveled in the ocean to get to the mouth of the river. In fact, some shad have been known to travel up to 2,000 miles in a single year. Along the way, they've had to battle the relentless currents, rocks, and rapids just to make it this far in their journey. But those are natural obstacles that they've been dealing with for thousands and thousands of years, so they're well suited to overcome those challenges. The real obstacles for these shad and all of the other anadromous fish that move through this river and its tributaries are the numerous dams that were built in the late 1700s that completely blocked anadromous fish from moving upstream to their spawning grounds. 
And by the early 1800s, thousands of miles of spawning habitat on the Connecticut River and its tributaries were cut off from the fish that needed them to reproduce. Those dams were built to harness the power of the moving water to turn gears and belts that were attached to saws for cutting timber, millstones for grinding grain into flour, and machines for making paper. However, in the modern era, the power of the moving water is captured to turn giant turbines that are used to generate electricity. These large hydroelectric dams have constructed fish passageways such as fish ladders and fish elevators that are used to help the fish move upstream beyond the dam, but in most cases those solutions are far from adequate. And even if these fish passageways were perfectly designed, when the fish are done spawning and they head back downstream to the ocean, many of them are pulled into the spinning hydroelectric turbines and chopped into pieces. Furthermore, these hydroelectric dams alter the flow of the river on a daily basis by either holding the water back behind the dam or by suddenly releasing it to flow downstream and the water levels in this river can change by more than three feet in the course of less than an hour. These dramatic fluctuations in the water levels can stir up sediment, smothering fish eggs, displacing baby fish, and causing massive problems with erosion on the riverbanks, all of which cause further disruptions to the lives of the numerous creatures that call this beautiful river home. And now it's time to watch these American Shad as they struggle to get past this rock dam and make their way upstream to spawn. However, Shad don't jump to get over big obstacles like this, preferring instead to use their powerful tails and streamlined bodies to power right through the rushing water. And it's not an easy thing to do by any means, because the water is moving really fast over these rocks, and it can take them several attempts to climb this waterfall before they succeed. Nonetheless, these shad will continue upstream until the water warms up enough for them to spawn. Then, they'll spawn in the dark, beginning at sunset and usually ending around midnight. As soon as they're done spawning, they'll start heading back downstream to the ocean. And if they can avoid being pulled into the hydroelectric turbines along the way, they might survive to come back and spawn again next year. But in the southern part of their range, the American Shad usually only spawns once and then dies. Nonetheless, their eggs will hatch in about one to two weeks depending on the water temperature. And the baby shad that hatch will stay in the river until the fall. Then, at about three to four inches in length, they'll head downstream to the ocean. And if they survive the journey, American Shad can live for up to ten years and reach a length of between one and a half to two feet. The adults are filter feeders, but they've also been known to eat small insects, shrimp, and fish eggs. And despite many efforts to restore these fish to the levels that they once were, their numbers are still declining in many places. And the main cause of their decline are the numerous hydroelectric dams that block their migration routes, alter the flow of the river, and kill fish that pass through the turbines. And it's not just the big hydroelectric dams that cause problems. It's also the smaller obsolete dams that are on many of the feeder streams where they affect countless other forms of aquatic life that use these rivers like highways in order to reach their spawning grounds or to move to a different part of the river to escape high temperatures in the summer months. So, I strongly encourage everyone to look around at their local rivers and see if there are any dams in their area that no longer serve a purpose. Then, do what you can in your community to convince local officials to remove these obsolete dams so that the fish can travel freely throughout the watershed. And let's all try to hold the power companies that operate these large hydroelectric dams accountable for the lives that they've disrupted because they make massive profits off of the river at the expense of the creatures who need it the most. And the fish that rely on the river have no voice, so they depend on us to do the right thing. Thank you so much for watching this important video, and have a beautiful day.